Happy sunshine, family. It's 11.16 p.m. Sunday, September 3rd, 2017. And I wanted to do uh, an update and a recap. It's the beginning of September. August was a pretty crazy month, and, and that's when I came into this. Before that, July was a pretty crazy month also for Randy and Heather. And... I'm coming into this in the middle of it and authoring my perceptions in real time and we've discussed quite a bit so let's just go for a recap here. To kind of put all of this in a nutshell, Heather Ann Tucci formed the One People's Public Trust or she was one of the people uh, involved with this. And on December 25th, so Christmas of 2012, three public trustees disclosed groundbreaking legal documents filed on behalf of the one people. Uh, from this moment, a grassroots movement was born as the documents swept across the globe like wildfire. Since these filings, hundreds of thousands of people across the world have been inspired to act on a common goal. Freedom from the old enslavement system and a choice to live their lives according to their own free will and free choices. Using a common legal process, current systems such as governments and banking have been lawfully and legally foreclosed upon, bringing an end to their corporate rampage of fraud and deceit. The One People's Public Trust documents open the door so people could free themselves from the failed systems and co-create a new system according to the desires and free will choice of each, acting in the highest good of all. And then you guys can go through this and read it. I know I'm going to, uh, but talks about a basic uh, timeline. This started in 2009. They talk about the global validity of the UCC rulings. And, and that's probably good for me to read too. The big question we need to be clear on is, if the Uniform Commercial Code, or UCC, originated in the USA, how and why are the One People's Public Trust and IUV rulings valid and applicable in every single nation and therefore every single person in this world? A bit of history. The UCC was first published in 1952 to harmonize the law of sales and other commercial transactions across the USA as well as actively discourage the use of legal formalities in making business contracts to allow business to move forward without the intervention of lawyers or the preparation of elaborate documents. However, it is important to know that all nations and states of this world somehow became legally registered corporations with the USA Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC. This means that all UCC rulings are legally applicable to all nations, corporate entities, and that every nation's employees, or citizens, are also recognized and treated as legal corporations and are registered as commercial vessels whose value can be traded and sold as chattel. And then there's some links to go for. So this has been going on for a while, guys. 2009 through 2012, a bunch of UCC filings happen. And this is really the foundation for uh, Heather Ann Tucci's narrative. And that's that the corporations like the USA Corporation, the banking corporations, the wealthy families that owned all those corporations, they have all been legally foreclosed on through UCC law. And that's the claim coming from Heather's camp. Now, in one of my prior videos, I mentioned that I would like to pull these filings from the UCC themselves and I got a whole lot of emails and a whole lot of comments from people and and I thank you very much um, I, I bet the bulk of those emails and comments were just pointing me to the downloads page on the i-uv website I've already been there guys that's not the point uh, 
I want to download the documents from the UCC filings themselves and then compare them to what I can get on the IUV website. Also, when you download the main file from the IUV site, let's see, tools, here, this original OPPT UCC filings link. And when you download this, you end up with a lot of PDF files and also a lot of TIFF files. That's going to be this link right here, the download all UCC filings. And the TIFF files, many of them are just the first page of multi-page documents. It's not complete, guys. So uh, that's why I put out a request for some walkthrough on how to pull these UCC filings. Uh, I've gotten anything from go to ucc.com, which is not anywhere associated with the Uniform Commercial Code, uh, to a whole bunch of different states UCC search index. And there's some pretty steep prices for accessing these documents, so it's uh, some extra barriers to get this information. Um, one of the things that we've talked about as we've been going through the grand jury testimony and then also going through the identity hearing testimony we've come up with a couple warrants whoops that's not the warrant let's see there we go and we've talked about these and my recollection from every bit of experience and interface that i've had with the criminal justice system is that a warrant must be signed by a judge or a magistrate. And when we look here, U.S. Magistrate Judge is crossed out, Deputy Clerk is printed in there. And that's the same way on both of these warrants. And some astute people sent me some links from Cornell Law School, specifically Rule 4, Arrest Warrant or Summons on a Complaint, and I really want to go to Rule 4B1, a warrant must. This is about the form. So it must contain the defendant's name, if it is unknown, a name or description by which the defendant can be identified with reasonable certainty. B, describe the offense charged in the complaint. C. Command that the defendant be arrested and brought without unnecessary delay before a magistrate judge or, if none is reasonably available, before a state or local judicial officer. And D. Be signed by a judge. Now, it appears that there's one exception to this, and this is in... Rule 9, an arrest warrant or summons, which is the product of indictment or uh, sworn written information. So Rule 9, subsection B, discusses the form, and the warrant must conform to Rule 4B1, which is what we just read, except that it must be signed, it must must be signed by the clerk and must describe the offense charged in the indictment or information. Now this is interesting because a clerk is neither a judge or a magistrate. And now we have what appears to be from the Cornell Law School information showing that a clerk or the clerk of courts is the only one that can sign a warrant stemming from an indictment. And when we look at the warrants, they're signed by a deputy clerk, though, not a clerk. So I found something very interesting here. I don't know what definitions.uslegal.com, what this website's all about. I, I, I haven't back-checked it, but 
They're talking about deputy clerk law and legal definition. Deputy clerk is an employee who is subordinate to the court clerk, kind of like a deputy sheriff is subordinate to the sheriff. A deputy clerk has got the authority to act in place of a clerk in the court's official business. Deputy clerk has got the authority to issue warrants, arrest orders, and contempt orders. Deputy clerk can also give a criminal first appearance and appoint indignant counsel, or sorry, in indigent counsel or public defenders. They can even sign and release persons held in custody under temporary confinement. And then, uh, what is this? May NV State 46, is that Texas Criminal 234? The court observed that the de deputy county clerk has the same authority as the county clerk in both taking affidavits as a condition proceeding, or sorry, <laughs> I'm just tripping all over my tongue. As a condition precedent to issuing licenses and for any and all other purposes as the clerk himself, the deputy clerk's official capacity may be proved by oral testimony. And and that's interesting. I some of the some of the language and the way that this I mean it, it, is this really a legal definition site? Uh, a deputy clerk uh, has got, has got, what? a deputy clerk has got the authority. No, a deputy clerk has the authority, but has got this? And then here again, has got. Uh, I wonder where this page came from. Do you guys know anything about this website up here? Um, also interesting, from one of the light reports videos, this appears to be the only picture that we can find of Parker Still. From the back, uh, looks like he's got on a, a light collared shirt underneath a dark suit, and he looks pretty bald. Also, we can note that when we come over here to another Periscope page, if we go into search and we type in the light reports, we don't get anything. And it's the light reports, all one word is the name of this channel. Even if we separate it out into words and search, we don't find anything. We do hat J we get one, one video. But if you look over here, look, look at all these hat J's that he has in his titles. There's plenty of them. You know what? You can't go in to Periscope, search for light reports. You can't search for Neil Wolf. You can't search for Hat J. This, this channel you can only access if you have a direct link. You cannot find it through search engines. So there is major censoring going on. Don't know what that's uh, ultimately about and who's behind that, but I've got my suspicions. But this entire case is really, really weird, guys. So now to bring us totally up to speed here, I pulled up the docket for this case on courtlistener.com. And again, I cannot verify this address. I haven't done any back checking on courtlistener.com. Is this truly a, a court reporting website? Is to, does anybody who's part of the legal system use courtlistener.com? So there's a couple interesting things in this 
court docket updates here. Uh, looks like Rebecca Lockwood is the court reporter. On August 29th here, this is the day that both Heather and Randy had uh, their hearings. This is the day that Heather was released on, what, house arrest with the ankle, uh, ankle monitor. Now, what's really interesting is the motion. Let's see, videographer. Let me just search this page. Control F. There we go. So, on the 28th, motion for videographer. Okay, so on the 29th, the court denies the request for a videographer, but look at this. It granted the request for a court reporter. Well, I guess I can't highlight. So, Heather Antucci, according to this, is gonna be able to have her own court reporter there. And I got pretty excited looking at that. They've also set a new trial date we're all the way out into January now, January 23rd of 2018, at 9 o'clock in the morning before Thomas A. Varlin. So, <laughs> this is going to be going for a while, guys, unless something happens in the different hearings that lead up to the trial. Now, there's something really interesting down here. Let's go to the next videographer. So it says, but the court reporter request was granted. But now look down here. The very last one. This just came a couple days ago, guys. Motion of defendant Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe to correct the minutes. She made a motion to correct minutes. And that motion was denied. And also, her motion to have present a court reporter and videographer 31 are denied this document 31 so in one place on the docket they say that she's granted her own court reporter but granted the request for a court reporter and then a few days later the motion for Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe to have present a court reporter and videographer are denied. So I don't know what's going on here, guys. But this website, courtlistener.com, appears to be one of the best places to get interesting info. We know now that the trial's not going to start until January 23rd of 2018. There's a discovery deadline of September 5th, so in two days, the prosecution has to give the defense all of its evidence that they have against Randy and against Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe. The defendant, so Randall and Heather, will have until September 29th to file their motions. The government has until October 13th to respond to those. And then there's a motion hearing that can be set. They've kind of got a place marker here for October 18th. And then the new trial date is January 23rd. So there's a new plea deadline. If they're going to change their plea, they can do so before the 21st of December. So that gives you guys a kind of time frame to look for. You can put these dates on the calendar and we can look for updates. Uh, another thing I've seen people talking about in the comments section is that on the IUV website, which we can go back and we'll find the Heather Antucci Giraffe or Hat J update page, which is current updates for Hat J and RKB right here. And we'll see that one of the very last things was that Heather was going to, right here, Heather is preparing a public statement. 
This will be written in a video of her giving the same statement. She will post them on her website. I haven't seen anything on her website yet, so let's go check that out. I don't see it on her website, guys. Her website appears to be the same as it's, as it's been. I've heard in the comments section that some people are saying that she's under a gag order. I haven't seen any observations, any legal source or anything like that that says that it comes from there, uh, that there is a gag order, excuse me. So that appears to be speculation at this point. Uh, if there is a gag order, I I would imagine that it would have been done when she was released, you know, through all this detention hearing and release hearing in front of Judge Shirley. I mean, my gut instinct tells me that, wow, if there's going to be a gag order, it's going to be issued here. But it doesn't, I don't, let's, let's just search for, there, there's no, there's no gag, I don't. I don't know where that information's coming from, it, but as far as I can tell, it's just speculation. People are speculating on why she possibly hasn't posted a video or made a public statement yet. Uh, she's been very vocal in public, everything leading up to her release from jail. Uh, she was posting or BZ was posting audio of phone calls from jail. And we've also got two transcripts here and both of these, both of these have boxes around every page. And there were some comments that, hey, the four corners rule Anything in a box on a legal document is separate from the rest of the legal document. And here we got page numbers and line numbers that are outside the box. And so the, the idea that's coming forth is that, oh, this is basically a, a completely blank document and worthless uh, when you take that into effect. I can't find a very succinct and articulate explanation that would point out that this box here has a legal significance to this particular Parker Still grand jury transcript and also to the Parker Still identity hearing transcript. Very interesting though, I can pull up other court documents that don't even even transcripts and, and there's no boxes on there so my question is what's up with these boxes is this standard practice if you are a paralegal or a lawyer or somehow involved with the courts or criminal justice system and you frequently go over transcripts, I'd love to hear from you. What, what do you think about this box that's around everything that we've received as far as a transcript so far from this RKB Hat J fiasco? I don't know. So lastly, I want to just reiterate a little bit of information about myself, who I am, who I am not, and what I'm doing here on this YouTube channel and what this channel is to me. I have experience testifying in a courtroom. I used to be a police officer. I was injured in the line of duty. I uh, wasn't able to heal back up uh, to continue to perform the job duties uh, that were required of a police officer and I was retired out. I've worked for 
four different departments. I've worked at the state level, I've worked at the county level, and I've worked at the city level. I've never worked at the federal level, but I have testified in federal court before. I have never been present at a grand jury hearing at all. Grand jury is pretty new to me, pretty fresh. But I am very familiar with general courtroom procedure and fairly familiar with legalese and just the energy that a lawyer or a cop or a judge carries as they are performing their duties. And none of what I see in either of these two transcripts remotely comes close to my understanding and my experiences in a courtroom. So I'm just a dude with a laptop on my kitchen table and I was really interested in this case, especially around the lack of reporting and lack of information. And so I started digging into it myself and finding a lot of interesting observations that I didn't see anybody really talking about. And so I started making videos. Now this YouTube channel is purely my research and study area, but for a bunch of different topics. I am not a news reporter. I'm not here to bring you the latest up-to-date information. I'm not connected with Heather Antucci's camp. I'm not connected with any of the other YouTube channels that are reporting on Heather Antucci Giraffe. I do not monetize my channel at all. I release everything that I can under Creative Commons license. In fact, there's only three videos and I was doing a commentary on copyrighted content, some professional sports games and also the Olympics. So two or three videos of mine do have ads running on them, but that was not my choice. But they are some of my earlier ones, but all of these ones are Creative Commons. That's because I want to know the truth. <clears throat> if you carry <clears throat> some articulate energy and you seem genuinely interested in what's going on, then I'll probably see you in my comment section or in my email inbox. I'm just making observations, I'm asking questions, and I'm doing that <clears throat> in a public forum. And so, first and foremost, I'm here for myself for my own journey of seeking the truth. Now, out of love and out of observation that there is absolute darkness, i.e. there is no light, and by light I mean ideas, there are no ideas, really, that are freely shared out there about this case. So my efforts here are to address that. I'm blown away by how many subscribers I have. I never <laughs> expected to get this big, never wanted really to be this big. What I really want to do is be focusing all my time on telescope stuff. Photographic forensics, astronomy, astrophotography, and truth seeking in general. But wow, I really don't want to be reading through all these transcripts and stuff. It's, it's not what I think is fun, but the truth is important here. And so I've taken a little bit of these jobs onto my plate just out of love and I hope that the rest of you or at least some of you do the same especially if you have pertinent experience to helping sort through this entire mess so I love you guys a lot and I really appreciate all the emails and all the comments. I took the past couple days off and I come back to my YouTube account and 
Wow. Well, it's just Monday I was at 1,000 subscribers, and a week later I'm almost at 2,000. So that's an observation that tells me that what I'm doing is appreciated out there, and I've gotten a lot of verbatim emails to that fact, pretty much. And I thank you for that. So we'll be back more, and now you guys kind of have a general nutshell for exactly what this case is, is about and what, it's, what the purported narratives are. And I just have no idea what we're going to find as we unwind it. But we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.